I hope you had a good weekend, and uh, I hope you're ready to uh, get started on a new topic today. Uh, today, we're going to get started with Arduino. So, we did a little bit of scratch. We at least introduced you guys to sort of some of the concepts behind programming and stuff like that. I know we didn't spend a whole lot of time on it, but uh, it is time to at least take some of that knowledge and apply it towards um, programming with uh, with like a language that has an actual syntax that you have to type out and things like that. For instance, Arduino. Um, now, since some of you have already familiarized yourself fairly well with Scratch, um, this should be a nice little sort of adjustment, and that's it. You know, you can take those same concepts that you learned in Scratch and apply them towards Arduino. Uh, for those of you who were new to Scratch, it may not be a bad idea to spend some time messing around with it uh, in your free time, just, again, to get more familiarized with the programming and sort of how it works and things like that. Because, like I said, moving on to something entirely new, uh, we're going to be spending the next uh, while working with Arduino. Um, I don't know entirely how long we're going to spend with it, but it's going to be—it's probably going to be a good number of lessons, um, just because that—that that does tend to be the bulk of the uh, the semester when it's um, when it's uh, when it's a part of the curriculum. Anyway. Arduino basics. This is like super duper getting started because you know there's there's a lot to introduce. So we're probably going to spend some time talking about all the different stuff that Arduino has and uh, what it what it is and stuff like that and uh, what we're going to be doing. And then we might be able to introduce like the first circuit. And that'll probably be all the time we have for today. Uh, we'll, we'll really get started on um, working with the Arduino in earnest on Wednesday, certainly, uh, if not by the end of today, but chances are Wednesday. So, okay. Um, by the way, I hope everyone's doing well. Um, Been. My computer seems to not be responding. Here we go. No, 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 no. You, we actually have a simulator for that, and it's free. It's online, um, and I'll introduce that to you guys today as well. So you don't need to actually have an Arduino board. It's cool to have one, but you don't need to have one. So basically, for the bulk of um, no, it's just online. Yeah, you just go to the website and, and like Scratch, it's it's an online app. Um, so that makes it easy as well. So three main questions that we're basically going to be addressing throughout the bulk of these Arduino lessons. Basically, what is Arduino? What can we do with it? And how do we control it? Um, now, the third one is probably going to be the one that we're going to spend the most time with. Uh, although, we'll sort of see applications and things we can do with it throughout the lessons. They're sort of rolled into it based on what we're going to be doing. You'll get an idea of what the Arduino can do. And, uh, you know, for right now, we'll address what Arduino actually is. Now, an Arduino, for those of you who may not be familiar, is a microcontroller. You may have heard the name before. You may be aware of the fact that it's, uh, you know, a board. Uh, it does stuff. But yes, uh, the, the technical term for an Arduino is a microcontroller. And um, what it is, is it's a small board that has connections and a processor on it that allows you to upload programs to it, that allows you to control electronics um, in a more, I guess, complex fashion. So when I say microcontroller, I guess it's micro compared to what? What what makes this a microcontroller as opposed to just a controller? 
Well, I'm glad you asked. By the way, that red board uh, picture, that is, if you were to make your computer, yes, you would have to sign up for it. Um, we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, If you were to make this the screen that you're watching right now full, like full screen, that would be about the size of the redboard, maybe a little bit smaller. Um, let me try full screening this. Let's see if that doesn't bring up a more appropriate size. It's a little, yeah, it's roughly that size-ish, roughly. Um, so it's not very large at all, and um, it is micro relative to PLCs, programmable logic controllers. Yeah, actually, it is a no-no. It's just it's basically a no-no, but painted red. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like it has some different features from the UNO and stuff like that, but yeah. Anyway, um, programmable logic controllers control factories, among other things, but a lot of times they're used for like factories and reactors and stuff like that. Uh, they're meant to automate certain processes, uh, like a manufacturing line, I'm hoping we're going to be able to take a look at the uh, online software that simulates the Arduino today. That is the idea. Uh, there is going to be a fair amount of lecturing, but that's what I'm trying to get into today. Um, so, uh, sorry, uh, train of thought. Yes, automating things like assembly lines and even stuff like the temperature and uh, the the, um, the amount of like resources coming into the factory or something like that. Like maybe it uses water as part of the process, and there's a water tank that draws in water from a nearby river or something like that. Uh, it'll regulate the the amount of water that the tank draws in and lets out and all that kind of stuff. Um, these things are big, they're complex, they're powerful, they're um, something that you need a lot of experience uh, before you can really start feeling comfortable with, but they're, um, they're meant for industrial applications, uh, and they're, they're fairly complex for it, because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of control that you can have over how they function. And on top of that, they're generally meant to be as um, gen uh, generalized as possible. So you could you could use a programmable logic controller or PLC for many different things. In fact, you could use the same PLC to do many different things. It just depends on how you plug it into the rest of the circuit. Uh, and an, an Arduino, a microcontroller, is a similar thing. It is meant to be a very generalized um, component in an electrical circuit that controls many different parts. It's meant to be like the brain of the circuit, uh, in essence. And it works on many of the same principles. However, it's generally more accessible and friendly for the average user. And um, it's not as, by, the, by, that, by that same token, you do sacrifice some of the, uh, some of the uh, flexibility that a PLC has and some of the power. You generally wouldn't want to have an Arduino running a factory. That would not be a good idea. You wouldn't want to have an Arduino running some automated process on a reactor. Not a good idea. Um, but yes, so that's what they are. They're sort of like a scaled down version of a programmable logic controller. Now, that may not mean much. You know, you might be like, okay, so I still don't know what this is. That's because they can be a little bit hard to define until you use one, especially when it comes into the question of what can we do with it. Because there's no real set sort of thing that you do with them other than automating stuff. But the thing is, they're, they're used as a controller for many different things. In essence, with an Arduino, 
it's it's very much a project uh, enabler, I suppose. It's you're able to do so many things with it that a lot of times your imagination is the limit as to what you can and cannot do with it, or what you do end up doing with it. Um, for instance, in these picture examples, we have one controlling what looks like a CNC machine or a 3D printer. That's a 3D printer. The two spools mess. Uh, mess with my perception, but yeah, it's a 3D printer in the lower right-hand side, and or lower left-hand side, and then the upper right-hand side, there's a quadcopter. Both of these things can be controlled with an Arduino. So <clears throat> one of them is a manufacturing machine, and one of them is a vehicle. Um, and the Arduino can control either one of them. It's okay. It's totally fine. That's doable. You can use an Arduino to... Um, uh, the example I used with the high school class was you could like hook an Arduino up to a deadbolt, um, have it connected to your uh, Wi-Fi in your house, and you could write an app for your phone. So you could lock your door and unlock your door while you're not at home. Presumably, locking your door would be the the main draw of it. Although I guess if you're sitting outside and you got a bunch of groceries and you don't know where your keys are or something like that, you can use your phone, unlock the door, get inside, that kind of thing. Um, so that's you know that's that's one application. You can you can make an Arduino that, uh, or you can hook an up Arduino to a bunch of LEDs and create like a, a light cube that has a bunch of designs going across it uh, in three dimensions. You can you can hook up an Arduino to uh, a little robot that goes and you know that, that like hangs off of your bookshelf and grabs books and, and hands them down to you. And if you have like a really tall bookshelf, you could have an Arduino hooked up to uh, your your cat feeder. So, you know, it can feed the cat at specific hours of the day. You know, just open up a thing and then the cat food dumps out. Um, or if, like, you know, the cat... There was actually one project that I saw that was... Um, this dude had a bunch of little RFID uh, units, radio frequency identification units inside of ping pong balls. I believe they were ping pong balls. Anyway, um, he would hide them around the house. And what his cat had to do is his cat had to find them basically hunt them down, find them, bring them back to a tube, put them in the tube, and as soon as uh, the machine registered that all three of the ping pong balls were retrieved, or four or whatever, uh, it would open up a little door and a bunch of food would spill out into the food bowl. So basically the cat had to go hunting in order to eat. Oh yeah, see, there you go, Liam. Raspberry Pi is a little bit different from an Arduino because a Raspberry Pi um, is... Uh, there's a reason why the term microcontroller exists to distinguish itself from like microcomputer. Um, the the Arduino is, is is a little bit different than a Raspberry Pi uh, in terms of uh, overhead and and uh, software and stuff like that. But yeah, no, no, no. That there you go. You could you could do that with an Arduino as well. You could you could have an Arduino control the the motors on the the. Uh, security camera and send information back to your computer or something like that. So that's that's totally a thing you could do too. Like there are a lot of things that you can do with um, Arduinos. I, I'm, I'm not being facetious when I say like your imagination really is the limit. Um, and that's why they can be hard to sort of categorize. You know, what do you do with it? Well, what do you want to do with it? You can probably find a way to make it work. Um, some things are going to be more complex than others. Some things are going to require materials that you may not have. Um, like you may not have access to stuff easily, so that might actually limit your ability to make it. But if you had all the supplies that you needed, your imagination would be the limit for this sort of thing. Anyway, um, how do we control it? Well, you might notice... Now let me go back up real quick. You might notice that there's a whole bunch of little pins and slots and plugins and chips and connections and there's there's a reset button and you just it's just kind of like what what do I do with this? How does this work? Well, like I said, an Arduino at its core is kind of like the uh, the brain of a circuit you utilize it to allow your circuits to do much more complex things. 
Uh, I have two of the boards that are in the pick. Nice. Yeah. So you've probably experimented with Arduino at least a little bit. Um, but yeah. So in essence, there's there's the SparkFun Inventors Kit, which is something that you can get if you're interested in in um, in Arduino and want to continue with it. I'm not advertising for SparkFun. I just mean that it's it's one of many that exists out there that you can use, um, you can purchase and use. Uh, it's one we've used in the past. Um, so I can I could say you know that it's it is a viable option, but you know I, I there could be other ones out there which are better. Who knows? Uh, at any rate. Um, Let's say you, you did end up getting one of these. Well, you'd open it up. There would be an Arduino. There would be a breadboard. There would be a bunch of jumper cables, or jumper wires, as they're, as they're called here. And then you'd have a whole bunch of components, LEDs, LDRs, uh, piezo elements, resistors, sensors, transistors, uh, variable resistors, diodes, motors, buttons, input. So there's a bunch of input and output and, and wiring stuff and things like that. In fact, there's a whole lot of things. There's the flex sensor, the soft potentiometer, servo, you know, LCD screen. So an Arduino by itself is generally not going to be enough in order to do some of the stuff that you want to do. You have to hook it up to other electrical components. But there is a hardware aspect to the Arduino. It's got stuff that can plug into it and that it can plug into in order to provide power in controlled ways, hence microcontroller, um, to the circuit. Ways that are meaningful to you as a human being, like uh, turn this thing on when I press this button over here so that I can, you know, turn my turn my lamp into like a red lamp, that kind of thing. Or I can, I can change it into a blue lamp if I want to. I just got to turn this, like maybe you have a knob that's that's uh, bolted to the wall, screwed to the wall, and you turn it, and like one end of the knob is red, and the other end of the knob is, I don't know, blue, green, whatever color you decide. Or it can run through like a rainbow of colors, and you can just twist it and change the color to, change the light to whatever color you want, that kind of thing. You know, the, the inputs and outputs. And the Arduino is somewhere in the middle controlling that. Anyway, there's a hardware aspect to the Arduino. I'm going to take a moment just sort of going over all the different parts of the Arduino because that kind of can sometimes sort of help uh, give an idea of what an Arduino can do. Well, first of all, we got the power jack. No surprise there. Uh, if it runs on electricity, it's got to get electricity so that it can run. I mean, I think that's pretty, uh, that's pretty straightforward, right? USB. USB so that you can load information from your computer onto the Arduino, load programs from your computer onto the Arduino. Uh, you can use it in lieu of a power jack. Uh, it will also provide enough power, uh, at least to have it running. It may not necessarily provide enough power for it to power things that require more electricity, like large motors and things like that. Um, and certainly you'd want to be careful with things that require large amounts of electricity anyway, because those have the potential to burn out things that use less electricity and cannot take as much electricity. Uh, but that's, that's, a, that's a concept that would be, is good to explore when you become more comfortable with an Arduino anyway. So for now, we'll just say that the USB is something that will also power the Arduino in lieu of a power jack. We've got power pins. Uh, power pins a lot of times are good for the circuit that you're building. Uh, so you can send power out from the Arduino, constant power out from the Arduino. You can use it to ground a circuit. Uh, because complete circuits always require a ground, um, or at least a place for the power to go. Uh, you can you can um, well, that's mainly what this is for. Although there are uh, there are a couple of pins on here that will reset the Arduino if they you know if they receive a signal like a little bit of electricity uh, or flip a thing on or off. Then you've got analog and digital. Analog and digital pins. Now, I'm sure you guys have heard those terms before, analog and digital. Uh, I'm certain that you guys have heard the term digital before. 
uh, but maybe, you know, yeah, yeah, analog and digital clocks, that's definitely one example. Um, maybe, maybe you haven't been told entirely what the difference between the two is, uh, at least with re uh, relation to power, uh, since we're, we're interested in that right now. Because the main draw of the Arduino is it's able to send power out, right? That's sort of the, uh, that's sort of the idea behind the Arduino, is it sends power out at the times we want it to, or when we need it to, and the waves we want it to, or needed to. So giving us options as far as how we send that power out, well, analog and digital are just two of those options. They're two of the really big options. But anyway, what does it mean? What does it all mean? Be happy to tell you. But for to, uh, for that to work, I'll need to uh, need to open up Paint and do some wonderful painting. If Paint wants to open, Paint does not want to open. So instead, I'm just going to draw directly onto the screen. Hooray! Hooray. Okay. So imagine for instance the Arduino has the ability to send five volts of power. That's just one of the things it can do. Now imagine you want to hook a circuit up to your Arduino, and you use the digital pins. Here is a graph. On this graph, I have time. You know, here's one second, here's two seconds, here's three seconds, and so on. You can just think of the amount of time that the Arduino has been on. That's supposed to be a four, but that turned into, I don't know what that turned into. And then you have, over here, you have the amount of power you can send out in volts. At the top is five, because that's the max it can send out. At the bottom is zero, because zero is the minimum it can send out. It can send out no volts up to five volts. Now here's the thing with digital. It does. It looks like a, I don't know, like maybe a pitchfork and an asterisk overlaid one another, um, or a, yeah, like a dragon head or a, a crab. Like here, it's two eyes up here, and then it's got some legs, and then it's got two claws, which he's just sort of putting together into like a prayer sort of position. Anyway, um, zero five volts, one two three four five seconds. With digital you really only have two options as far as sending power is concerned. Either nothing or all of it. So if we were to look at a graph of this, it might be sending zero volts for the first second. And then from seconds one to three, it's sending all of its power. And then from seconds three to five, it's sending no power. And then from five on, it's sending full power. If you were to look at a graph like this, you might notice it has like sort of these boxes. That's because the idea is that it moves from zero to full power and back down to zero instantaneously. It might hang out at zero or full power for a while, but it will not send a value in between. Imagine, you know, the, like the light switch for, I don't know, your bathroom. You know, you just, you, you have an on off switch and you just flip it on and the lights turn on. Then you flip it off and the lights turn off. That is what digital is like. There are only two values, either full on or full off. You might think of them like full on or full off. And hey, does that look familiar? It's a funky zero, but that's meant to be a zero.
well, hopefully it looks familiar, ones and zeros, like binary, like what make up the, uh, the basic thinking uh, language of the computer. It's kind of why a lot of computer related stuff is referred to as digital. It's because all of those little millions and millions of transistors that hang out inside of a computer, they either send power in one direction or the other, full power or no power. And the combination of full power and no power values is what gets translated into something meaningful for us as people. For instance, pictures on your screen or my voice being translated you know, into sound waves and, and then electricity and sent through the internet and comes back out and trans gets translated back into sound waves uh, out of your speakers or your headphones or whatever. It's all sequences of ones and zeros. And it's kind of mind blowing to think that just with two values, either a one or a zero, we have enough combinations of those that we can do things like pictures, colors, information beyond that just sent through the internet, voice, uh, music, you know, games, and the fact that it's doing all of these things at the same time. Right now it is, sh it is showing you your desktop, it is showing you any programs you might have running, it's showing you go to meeting or go to webinar, I guess, it's showing you my desktop, it sh it's replaying my voice to you. Like think of how many ones and zeros are currently flowing through your CPU right now in order to enable this sort of thing. How fast this is all happening, your CPU and your GPU. Like that's kind of crazy. Plenty, yeah, like at least four or five. You know, four or five zeros a minute, at least. Um, anyway, a little bit of sidetrack. So that's digital. Analog is the other side of the coin. So again, let's say we have our our little graph here, our wonderful little graph. Time and volts. And again, from whoa, 5 to 0, this is a 5. There we go. Fix that. Now it's a very stylized 5. Um, and we have 1 and 2 and 3 and four and five, boop, 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 boop. Now here's the, here's the thing about analog. It can send no power, it can send full power, and it can send anything in between. So whereas this one looks like squares, which is a lot of times why it's referred to as a square graph, um, an analog is going to have sine waves, or just maybe just just curved, you know, lines. Like it, they're not necessarily going to be sine waves. Sine waves uh, a lot of times are uh, like the the power that's flowing through your house can be represented with a sine wave because um, it's alternating current. But at yeah, any rate, that's not important. A graph for an analog. might look something like that. Like, I guess, two ghosts standing next to one another. But, you know, it's possible. So, at second one, it looks like it's sending, oh, I don't know, 1.2 volts. And then at second two, it looks like it's pretty close to the 5 volts. At three, we hit 5, well, we already hit 5 volts. We're coming back down. We're a little bit less than at second two. Four is right around the same point. Five is max power. Uh, six, you know, we're we're dropping back down. Seven, we come down here and hold steady. You know, eight, we're almost back to zero. That sort of thing. But at, at any rate, you can you can send anywhere from zero to five volts. This geometry, I know it's amazing. Um, in addition, I mean, it doesn't have to be like it doesn't have to go up to max power or whatever. We could we could go up to 1.2 volts and then just hang out there the entire time. Or we could go up to you know full power and hang out there 
and then we could go down to 1.2 volts and hang out there. We can go up to 3 volts and hang out there, and then down to 2 volts and hang out there. You get the idea. It's any value in between 0 and 5. And a lot of times, uh, it's not going to look as clean cut as this digital, because the digital, the, the change is assumed to happen instantaneously, like not even... And, and realistically, it, it happens over time just very, 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 very quickly. But it's assumed to happen instantaneously. A lot of times in analog, you get like a smoother ramp up to full power and back down and stuff like that when you're doing this kind of thing. It can still be very, 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 very quickly. But, yeah. So that's the main distinction between the two. Digital is either on or off that light switch in your bathroom, flip on or flip off. Analog is on or off, and, well, it's just varying degrees of on is really the best way to put it. So think of like a, like how many of you have like one of those 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 dimmer switches in your dining room or your living room or something like that, where it's like a circular switch, and you turn it, and it, at one point it clicks, and then you can keep turning it, and the light gets gradually brighter and brighter and brighter until you hit the other end of the dimmer switch, and the light's like full on. That's an example of analog. So you can have it at like 50% power or like 30% power or 100% power or zero or, you know, 72 or whatever. You get the idea. Analog is uh, much more the domain of traditional uh, circuitry and stuff like that. A lot of the stuff that a lot of electrical components and things like that are uh, very much analog, um, with obvious, obvious exceptions being things that either send out full power or no power. Um, but like, you know, potentiometers would be an analog uh, components. Uh, a lot of sensors are analog components. There are digital ones, but a lot of them are analog because they'll read values from none to full uh, and everything in between. Uh, motors, many of the motors are analog. There are some digital motors, strangely enough. Um, but, you know, you'll learn about those as you get to them. Um, stuff like that. Stuff like that. Anyway, now that I've done that, erase all drawings. Let's come back to the lesson, even though we just we're still talking about the lesson. So you've got analog and digital pins on the Arduino. So you have the ability to either send or receive analog values or send or receive digital values. And in fact, with digital, you can simulate analog, but it's not, you know, it's not like the same thing, but you can simulate it. There's another one, analog versus digital. I noticed, um, was it Jean-Marc said clocks? top one is an example of an analog clock, while the bottom one is an example of a digital clock. Um, just because an analog clock, you can, you, can technically, you can technically read values in between minutes and seconds, um, depending upon how the clock is built. Uh, whereas with a digital clock, it's always going to be whole values. Uh, you've got an analog and a digital uh, set of like, a, like circuit reading equipment. It's, that one it's probably a multimeter at the top, just like the bottom one is, although it does kind of remind me of an oscilloscope. But an oscilloscope actually has, like, you know, a graph and on it and stuff. Anyway, um, probably two different examples of, of uh, multimeters or digital readouts. Then you have controllers. You have an analog joystick at the top, in fact, connected to a GameCube, and a digital um, joy pad, I guess, on the bottom, which looks like it's part of a uh, Wii controller. And again, the, the digital pad can read up, down, left, right, or nothing. The analog joystick can read up, down, left, right, or nothing, or up, left, or down, right, or down, left, or up, right, or, um, you know, up by upright at 50% power and uh, down by down left at 75%, you know, tilt and you, you get the idea. 
So the two are very important to, uh, both are very important to many electrical concepts and gadgets and things like that that you'll be dealing with. So just so you know. Is another thing. Analog, infinite possible values. Digital, finite possible values. Which technically that's true. How might you have infinite possible values if you can only go from 0 to 5, though? Any ideas? Yeah, they're te exactly. There, there technically are. There are infinite numbers between one and five. Um, now, I was just using that as an example. Like, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be five. It can be twelve volts, or it can be uh, one hundred and twenty volts, or it can be two hundred and forty volts, or it can be uh, nine volts. You know, whatever. Um, but there, yeah, there, there are inf there are an infinite amount of numbers between one and five. So you have one, and you have one point one. 1 1.01, 1.001, 1.0001, 1.0001, 1.0001, 1.0001, 1.0001, and so on. Yeah, you get the idea. Like the, there are an infinite number of values. You can have one point and then like it, like a million zeros and then 1932, which is going to be different from one point and a million zeros, 1933, technically speaking. Realistically, we're probably not going to be able to tell the difference between the two of the, those two values. But technically speaking, mathematically speaking, those are two separate values. And potentially, even from a physics standpoint, you know, we might be able to one day read the difference between those two things. You never know. You know, like that could be that could be kind of neat if we could, though. The ability to get a precise reading down to like, you know, the thousandth or the hundred thousandth or the millionth decimal place. And I don't mean like, you know, 1.001. .001. I mean like 1.0999 times one. Who knows if that's even physically possible? Mathematically speaking, it is. But, you know, anyway, I digress. Digital is a fin uh, finite number of possible values. It's either going to be on or off. So in our, again, our hypothetical example of zero to five, it's going to be zero or five. Anyway, I think I've driven that point home enough. <laughs> There's a reset button that exists on the Arduino. The reset button is predictably to reset the Arduino. This can hap this can be useful in case, you know, you are writing code for your Arduino and something funky happens and you accidentally wrote an infinite loop in and now your Arduino just doesn't stop doing things, or if you want to test like the setup loop or the setup uh, function of the Arduino, and it only happens, you know, for like a half a second, but you want to just like check and make sure all the stuff happens, so you just keep hitting, excuse me, the reset button every once in a while just to see it boot up again and watch its boot up process, that kind of stuff. Reset button basically just starts your program all over again on your Arduino. Yeah, won't we'll stop saying hello world. No, reset, reset. Um, TX LED transmitting. Now, now we're getting into the LEDs that are listed on it. But these are actually good to know. The the TX LED lets you know that the, the Arduino is transmitting information out of its USB port. Basically, whenever it's lit, it's transmitting information at that exact moment. It is sending information out. It is sending a one out. If it's doing that, you know that it's sending information out on the USB, which you can then diagnose by looking at like the serial monitor and stuff like that. If you have those capabilities set up in your Arduino, all that kind of good stuff. The RX LED is receiving R cross, T cross, and R cross. I don't know. It really depends. Um, receiving means that it is receiving information on the USB. It's not just available to receive information, but it is actively at this moment receiving a one when that LED is lit. It is receiving information at that specific point in time. Again, good to know, uh, to see like, you know, maybe if you're not sure if it's communicating with your computer, uh, if you get an RX that starts to blink and freak out, then you know that, hey, 
it's receiving. Pin 13 LED. You might be asking, why is one labeled pin 13 LED? Well, I'll tell you. Pin 13 LED lights up whenever there is electricity being sent out, or I guess in, depending upon you know whether or not you have it as uh, setting or receiving, on pin 13, specifically this pin right here. And you might be going, but why? Why would you have an LED for one pin? Why? Well, pin 13 can be your diagnostic pin. Let's say you built this whole big circuit and you hooked your bare Arduino to it and you started programming and you uploaded the program and your circuit doesn't work. It's not just like it works improperly, it's that nothing happens. Well, where might the problem lie? Well, I don't know. Is it in the circuit? Is it in the Arduino? Is it in your programming? What could it be? Well, if the pin 13 is lighting up, you can at least verify that, hey, it's sending information out of pin 13. So the Arduino is presumably doing something that it's supposed to do, especially if it, you can figure out when it's supposed to light up, like maybe when you press a button. If you press a button and pin 13 lights up, then you know that the Arduino is receiving or sending information properly. And then you can start narrowing down the issue. You can go like, okay, so if the Arduino is doing what it's supposed to do, it's probably my circuit. Now I got to go through my circuit and make sure that everything's plugged in correctly, uh, or you know, all of my components are operating properly, that kind of thing. But at least it allows you to narrow things down. If your pin 13 isn't, or if your pin 13 LED isn't operating properly, then chances are it's something with your Arduino. Okay, so now I got to go over my programming and make sure that my program is written correctly. Uh, I got to make sure that my program got uploaded to my Arduino. I got to make sure that my Arduino is receiving power, which it would be a much better idea to use the power on LED for that. But you could. But yeah, so that's why that exists. That is that is for diagnostic purposes. And uh, we'll just go ahead and skip that little quiz thing. Um, so I'm going to introduce you guys really quickly to 123D Circuit. Like it's going to be super quick. I'm just basically going to tell you guys that you need to create an account so that we can get started on a Wednesday. Um, but... 123D circuit, and by extension circuits.io, in fact, we'll actually go to circuits.io, is what you need in order for um, you to simulate the Arduino. That's what we're going to use. And uh, I'll, you know, I'd recommend you guys do the same thing so that we can we can all follow along. But yeah, it's, it's pretty cool because it allows you to not only simulate circuits, it allows you to simulate our, uh, an Arduino. So you can actually put code into circuits.io say, upload this to the Arduino, it will upload it to the virtual Arduino on 1, 2, 3D circuits. You can hit simulate, and it will run as if it's an Arduino running the program that you wrote, which can simplify things significantly. Uh, a couple of years ago, we were using actual physical breadboards and circuits and things like that, which was really cool, but um, there was a whole mess of issues with getting them to communicate with the computer properly. Uh, and everybody had different issues with that, and sometimes we had to download specialized drivers that allowed the computer to communicate with the Arduino, but some other people required different drivers, so that we had like four or five different versions of drivers depending upon the computer, and you just had to go through them to see which one would work, and then, you know, it wouldn't always work consistently, so even if you got it working one day, it wouldn't work the next day, and then we also had to worry about the fact that people were hooking up things wrong, and sometimes they create, you know, like, they burn out components, which means that they wouldn't be able to do the circuit, and blah, 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 blah. Uh, where do we go on circuits.io? Okay, so excellent question. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to circuits.io. <sighs> and I'm going to log out of my, my uh, account so that you guys can see the same thing that I'm looking at. I'm, I can look at the same thing that you guys are looking at. So if you go to circuits.io, as in electrical circuits, and then a dot, and then an IO, the letters dot IO. Um, you'll be taken to this site. You'll want to select sign up for free in the upper right-hand side. This will bring up the Autodesk circuits um, login, in which case you put in your country and your birth date, 
and it'll probably, I believe if your birth date is within a certain range, it's going to ask for parental permission. So let me go ahead and set it to be 2003, no, let's say 2005. And it's March 9th, 2005. Your parents' email. Yeah, it'll ask for your parents' email, um, which, you know, they'll, they'll need to verify your account, essentially, which is part of the reason why we're not going to really go over it today. I mean, you could do that, too. That's entirely up to how comfortable you are. That's 13 days from, from your birthday. Oh, man. Why is 2016 even an option? For those really precocious babies. And 13 days from your birthday, that's the year I graduated from high school. Uh, so, yep. Yep. Now we're going to talk about that. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to sign in. Exactly. Uh, hello, world. Let's build something with an Arduino. I am a baby. I am a babby. How is Babby formed? Right, right, right. No, I know, but it was still the same year. And that's the year I graduated high school, so it's like, well, <laughs> yes, you do make an account. That's, that's what I was just talking about. You make an account. So go ahead, spend the time between, you know, now and Wednesday getting your account set up. If that means, you know, getting parental permission, then do that as well. Uh, if you don't need it, then excellent. Uh, and then on Wednesday, we'll get started with 123D circuits or circuits.io. I, I keep wanting to call it 123D circuits because it used to be that until it got purchased by, I believe, Autodesk or rebranded to circuits.io. Oh, if you already have an account, excellent. Um, we'll, spend, we'll spend Wednesday exploring that. Um, by way of building our first circuits. Uh, I'll also spend time talking about the hardware and the software side of the Arduino and how we do, you know, the controlling and all that kind of stuff and what we can control. It'll be a very simple circuit. We'll just make an LED blink. And that's it. Super easy. But that's what we'll spend Wednesday doing. Um, for now, though, I'm going to go ahead and prepare the poll questions for you guys. Uh, just so, again, same deal, so I can ensure that I'm ready for my next class. Uh, and I want to give you guys the opportunity to have some question and answer time before I have to uh, head on out. So anyway, here we go. First poll question incoming. 